He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. So, here's the DNA test that's just arrived. So, I took a DNA test. Swab the inside of your cheek, fuel. Okay, it's nothing worse than that. <laughs> I was thinking, where does this have to go? This is where I admit I hate reading instructions. Yada yada, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Insert the swab head between your cheek and lower gums. Roll the swab ten times. Here I am doing this. Mm-hmm. Mm. Glad this is not TV. Place the swab back in the tube until you firmly hear a click. This week on Healthy or Hoax, we'll find out if a 20-second swab can unlock all my body's potential. There are a bunch of these sort of online DNA testing options available. We chose one that just looks at diet and fitness and costs about 80 bucks. But you can get more detailed reports that cost a lot more. It took several weeks for my results to come in and when they did, I have to say I was underwhelmed. Look, it was easy enough to understand, but it just didn't seem to resonate with what I know about myself. So I called in an expert to help me out. I mean, the reason I couldn't say no was, uh, look, you know, the thing is it does really interest me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a knowledge base I've got that it's just going to build on it, I suppose. So, yeah, like yeah, some people yeah. read magazines and you read. Yeah, <laughs> that's, like that, that's right, yeah. <laughs> William Ferguson is a GP from CUMU, but he's been doing genetic profiles on patients for about seven years now. People with complex chronic disorders where, you know, you reach the end of what you can do in mainstream medicine. And, uh, you know, with the incredible explosion of knowledge we've had since, you know, mapping the human genome and so many of the dots have been connected now in terms of, you know, the underlying drivers of chronic disease. And we're starting to be, you know, get some really meaningful windows into that. And so when you've got people who are really sort of stuck, uh, you know, I feel very motivated to sort of try and get to the bottom of it for them. And I'm a very big believer in the fact that going down the pathway of individualised and so-called personalised medicine is probably the way forward. We'll come back to my test results and whether they can help me eat and train the way I'm supposed to, as the website claims. But first, let's bring in Professor Stephen Robertson. I'm the Cure Kids Professor of Paediatric Genetics at the University of Otago. He's also on the leadership team of Genomics Aotearoa. Which is a large consortia of people interested in life sciences and genomics. Robertson's been interested in the field for years now. It caught my eye as being something that uh, held potential to be explanatory and to to sharpen medicine, make it more precise. But he says the idea's not really new. Many people ask me about how they can use these new genomic tools to sort of clarify their crystal ball about what might be ahead for them in life. And I do tell them that perhaps the best genomicist in their family is their grandmother and that some um, time around the kitchen table with a full pot of tea could perhaps um, be their best first bid. Genomics is something we've talked about and are, I think, intuitively interested in. Mm. We like to understand our familial relationships and what's carried with them. So if our queer and komatsua hold this knowledge, why are we leaving the table and the teapot and using these online DNA kits? I think some people like to lift the bonnet. They like to understand what the engine is underneath that is driving these things, how it came to be. But it won't necessarily look at their lifestyle and their kind of choices that they've made that will impact health, will it? Well, that's right. And, of course, those things aren't um, independent domains either. If you pause to think about temperament, for instance, or personality, it's well acknowledged that they carry genetic determinants, and I think any person who's watched their family grow up will see temperamental factors that um, run, run in families. And, of course, that predisposes you to the type of experiences you might select or be attracted towards and therefore the type of environments you find yourself in and and how you conduct your life. And so these things hugely overlap. They interact with one another uh, reciprocally. And so um, the whole idea that we can begin to sort of uh, disambiguate this, pull it apart, and have all those different factors um, itemised and understand how they interact is an enormous task. And we're only just beginning. So it's an enormous task. Does that mean that you suggest it probably can't be achieved in a home-based sort of kit? Well, there's two questions there. Can it be achieved? I sort of am continually being surprised about the reach of genomics and what it can explain in healthcare. But at the same time, you asked me of a home kit. 
will be able to deliver on that. And I'm a little bit sceptical in that respect because that brings with it limitations of technology and accuracy. And what I would like to sort of, um, and I'm a little bit self-promoting here, the knowledge that a, a skilled health practitioner can bring in, in terms of their lens as to what might be sitting in front of them and what might be explainable by either genes or environment. Let's go back to our skilled practitioner then, William Ferguson. He says the key is in which genes you look at. You've got to look at genes that have, uh, first of all, common variants uh, and variants that there is a good research base that shows that they're associated with you know, a range of important conditions. And then it's important to make sure that there's also some sort of research base that says, hey, there are some things we can do to alter the expression of this gene, you know, through diet, lifestyle, or medications you might use or medications you might want not to use. Because there's no point in finding out about a gene you can't do a darn thing about. Mm. And you also want genes that relate to underlying drivers of disease processes, inflammation, oxidative damage, uh, problems with a really important biochemical process in the body we term methylation. These sorts of things just come up over and over again across a whole array of disease processes. And so you want the genes that, that feature majorly in those underlying drivers. So you want well-researched genes with some well-researched things you can do with those genes. But that's not all. And you don't want to look at individual genes. You want to look at groups of them that relate to that, that pathway. There's almost nothing to gain from looking at a single gene in isolation. And so... If somebody's got a, an unfavourable, you know, single snip, as we call it, you don't want to have them lying awake at night over it. OK, so we need a bit of a jargon check here. A snip is a common genetic variation which can cause genes to behave differently. I think they say on average, you know, people, anybody would have anything up to a million of these SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms or variants. But it may be, at the moment, we think maybe only about 100 of them are really useful and actionable. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, things are changing all the time. But even if you've got a group of well-known genes with well-known variants that cause well-researched conditions and which you know you can have an effect on, they're not the only complicating factors. The ability of a gene to be programmed, this whole uh, concept of epigenetic programming, which, if you like, is the software that sits on top of the hardware of your genes and, and essentially dials them up or dials them down. And a lot of that, of course, is set in utero. For many of these genes, you don't know whether they're actually turned up or turned down. And then there's the fact that signals coming in from the environment, especially everything you put in your mouth, is going to be sending signals to those genes through things we call transcription factors that may, again, turn that gene on or turn that gene off. And So, so you, none of that could have been known by the test that no, I did, could it? No, no. So, so those are all the wild cards. And so, you know, by the time I've kind of talked myself this far into what we've done, you'd probably say, well, look, hey, just looking at nine genes in isolation and knowing nothing else... How could you extract anything meaningful from that? I actually felt like I was reading a horoscope. Like if I wanted to, I could see something that related to me, but not particularly. Hmm. Does that surprise you? Uh, not at all with just looking at, at those nine genes, which, I mean, they looked a little bit at weight and they looked a little bit at lipid profiles, but hey, why don't you just measure your lipid profile? And so, was it worth spending my money on this DNA test? The short answer is probably no. But we don't want the short answer. Having said that, there are definitely some gene variants where we can get some really quite useful insights. For example, that, um, that PPAR gamma gene, that's one that is to do with programming fat cell size and in a way that directly links with your ability to be insulin resistant, which of course leads to diabetes. And so if you've got you know good expression of that PPAR gamma gene, which you do, then that is going to reduce your risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And in the way that I was talking about the way these genes talk across you know, underlying pathways and mechanisms, we can say that that PPAR gamma gene, when you tend to overexpress it, it's going to be anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. It's going to be neuroprotective, protective against renal disease, against um, various gastrointestinal disorders. 
and there's a tendency if you've got that better expression of it to have a more normal response to weight loss uh, with diet and exercise if you were not expressing PPAR gamma very well there'd be some key things we'd advise you so for example alcohol is very good at shutting down PPAR gamma and so you know if you had the bad variant of this alcohol is going to weigh quite heavily mm. if you're zinc deficient you know PPAR gamma function is very zinc dependent and um exercise is very beneficial for increasing PPAR gamma. And then, of course, this talks to one of the other genes in your profile that I think is another very useful gene, and that's that adiponectin gene. And adiponectin is involved very much in the way you process fats and also your glucose metabolism. So it kind of relates rather to what the PPAR gamma thing was doing. So I think, you know, they get points for putting those two together. Um, so, for example, if you had bad variants of both of those, that would stack in my book a bit as being, hey, that's an area we need to actually, you know, look at a bit more closely. You've sort of got the, you know, foot in each camp with that particular gene. Uh, you're heterozygous, so you've got one copy from one parent that's beneficial and one copy from the other parent that's less beneficial. I know who's who as All right, well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And so having increased levels of this adiponectin makes you much more sensitive to insulin. It has protective effects against arterial disease. It's anti-inflammatory. It prevents blood from clotting too much. And interestingly, that heterozygous variant that you've got, which is arguably you know, less advantageous than if you had the purely good variant of it, but it puts you at slightly lower breast cancer risk. Oh, wow. And so, you know, sometimes you look at one of these genes as being maybe advantageous for cardiovascular disease, but, but in fact, from a cancer perspective, that may not be the, the, the variant that you want. So that's just an example of that. So you want more of this adiponectin because it's going to have all of those beneficial effects. But if you become obese, it tends to shut down the production of it. And if you're inactive, it shuts down the production of it. And stress also shuts down the production of it. But here's a really interesting thing. There's a bunch of things you can do that will increase the expression of it. And top of that list, and I just love stressing this for people who've got the, you know, the really bad variant of this, that exercise increases the expression of adiponectin 260%. Wow. But wait for it. That can be achieved with three visits to the gym in just one week. And the benefit of that can be sustained for up to 10 weeks. Now, there are other gene variants like that FTO gene that's on your thing there where you've got to be doing like at least an hour of exercise of pretty high intensity for a prolonged period of time before you see any benefit with that FTO gene, which is very strongly linked with carrying extra weight. But this adiponectin thing, if people are couch potatoes with that, and if they've got the unfavorable variant of this, they are absolutely wrecking themselves. And so this is a tremendous motivator for people. And to see that it really doesn't take that much. And I think these are some of the people who really light up when they do do a little well, bit of the exercise. You yeah, know? yeah, no, this speaks uh, to me. You can really feel how much better you feel because yeah. it has all of these anti-inflammatory effects right through your system as well. And then there are other things that we know benefit it. So, for example, omega-3 helps it, um, olive oil helps it, a Mediterranean diet helps it, more fibre in the diet helps it. A very interesting plant extract called berberine um, is good at increasing the expression of it. It's also increased by PPAR gamma, you know, the one that we mm. talked about before. So, you know, those two genes are kind of talking to each other in some way. So then if you say to me, okay, so the reason that going to the gym is really important for you is this, this, and this, and three times a week will have mm. this impact because of what you've just told me, then that's actually, that's inspirational. I can work with that. Yes, yeah. But it didn't say that. No, no. <laughs> you know, one thing that does come out of this is there are so many different things that, you know, might sound like sensible advice in terms of, say, diet, lifestyle, supplements, all these sorts of things. You know, how do you choose what's really going to help somebody? And sometimes what you do get out of this is a sense of what that person's priorities really are. Sometimes exercise just screams at you out of these profiles. And other times, you know, it might be more obviously about certain aspects of the diet or whatever. Or it might make sense of, you know, why that person does so badly on certain medications and uh, why they don't tolerate coffee and, and things like this. So a couple of potentially useful insights. But there was also one gene that Ferguson was less sure of. That FADS1 gene. I mean, 
gee, that, that's really a complicated story. If I spend a whole day reading papers trying to understand a gene and at the end of it I still don't know what I would do with it, uh, then I'm thinking, why are we even measuring this at this point in time? And so that FADS1 looks like a really interesting gene. And I talked to uh, Justin O'Sullivan at the Liggins Institute about it, and they've got a big interest in that gene because it seems to talk right across the genome to all sorts of other specific tissues and organs that have got nothing to do with the function, it would seem, directly of that FADS1 gene. But when you look at the research around it, it all suddenly becomes very complicated. For example, it depends exactly what your ethnicity is as to um, whether it's meaningful or not. So, Because it doesn't actually measure that, does it? It can't know all of that, not with the nine no, genes I've looked no, at. No, that, that's right. So, for example, you know, one of the papers I looked at showed that for the variant that you've got, if you were Japanese, it would increase your risk of diabetes, but if you're European, it would decrease your risk of diabetes. And, of course you know, you're Maori, so we don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but, um, but they didn't say that. They didn't say, by the way, we don't really know. No, that's right. And then having, you know, literally spent the day reading all these papers and realising the extent to which the literature was conflicted and, and how much the uh, expression of that gene is influenced by what you're already eating or not eating in your diet. Well, there is a simple thing, a test you could do to measure in the blood, for example, the ratio of arachidonic acid. So in the case of that FADS1, I'd be much more interested in a simple blood test to measure that ratio rather than trying to figure out you know, what it meant for you. So they might have thrown it in there because, for one thing, people like me have no idea what it means anyway. You know, they could just mm. name a gene and I wouldn't know what that means. Mm. And maybe for another thing, because it does have widespread impact, but you won't know that impact unless you know all of those other factors you're talking and, about. And of course, even the people who really know at the Liggins Institute, even they say, hey, we just don't know yet, yeah. you know, about that particular gene. So, uh, you know, they've earmarked it as a really interesting and influential one. But I would put that in the in the ballpark of, hey, we don't know enough about it yet. But what you've told me is a whole lot more than I got in the printout. For right. Instance. Yeah. So really, if I could bring it to a GP and and then have this analysis or someone with your level of understanding, it would be valuable. But really, to me, I mean, most people are just going to send things in, send their money away, and read the script, which really didn't right. tell me it much. Right. Didn't, it didn't say much at all. I think it said you should. Watch your diet, check your lipid profile, and exercise but more. Every <laughs> just, you know, women's well, magazine well, says yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. No, that's right. <laughs> so it does really sound like you're looking through a keyhole, really, <laughs> yeah. by getting one of these things. Yeah. Um, it's perhaps easier to buy the most, but you need help with the interpretation. And and it does seem to me a little bit like it's just computer generated, and no one's actually applied analysis to that, it. That's right. Uh, although I think ultimately this will become so complicated that it'll only be. Uh, you know, computer learning and artificial intelligence and things that enables us to, you know, pull it together, you know, in a in a meaningful way. Although some of these, you know, some of these genes are standouts in their own right, but um, that's a relatively small number of them. And again, it's always going to be a bit of a lottery. I mean, I guess what I've learned from doing this so far is that you can spend a phenomenal amount of time on this with absolutely no guarantee that you can come up with something, you know, meaningful for the patient. But then every now and then you come across some really game-changing stuff, and I guess there's just enough of that to, you know, to keep me interested. Otherwise, I wouldn't have agreed to have come along today. That sentiment is backed up by Professor Robertson. There are some outstanding examples of that. I think we all know prominent uh, New Zealanders, prominent people around the world who have actually had that experience. Take, for example, our own Stan Walker and mm. his very public uh, battle with a genetic form, a genetic predisposition to stomach cancer that runs through his whanau. This whole hill, we've all been struck by this ugly curse, this ugly gene. I've watched everyone die. And the amazing story he told about um, making the decision to have his stomach removed to prevent that disease evolving in himself. Now that's all driven from genotype, but from a genetic test. And, uh, and so there's an outstanding example of how literally genomics can be life-saving. There are other offshore examples. Angelina Jolie's mm. um, similar experience with um, a BRCA mutation. They all relate to single, highly what we call highly penetrant uh, genetic factors. But they're all illustrative of the fact that genomics can bring these types of insights to our health. But that sort of genetic insight is quite different to my experience with the home testing kit, which was more kind of magazine quiz level insight. 
And Robertson has a warning about even the light and fluffy tests. Because they are poorly regulated, these companies can, can actually offer, for instance, testing of BRCA genes. There's wow. nothing stopping them, and they have done that before. And the trouble is that those results will have been generated in an area which is not regulated. And all of a sudden you find yourself with a potentially confronting uh, situation which really hasn't been generated in an environment which you, we all feel trust in. And so that's where the rubber hits the road mm. about whether this fascination we have with genetics and what might hold for us in the future changes from being um, recreational into something which can be very, very impactful and have a sharp edge. Like being told I'm predisposed to obesity, which I guess was really more baffling than confronting because I'm not obese and that's not an issue for anyone in my immediate family. So I had to wonder if the test is too general or if I've done something to adjust that predisposition. That's a very difficult question for me to answer for you specifically, but it could be well be both. But what's certain is that test will have measured a very, very small fraction of genetic determinants, which in some people of some ancestries have been shown to be related to a small degree with that tray obesity. Mm. And so what we're taking is we're generalising from a very, very small assay of a very, very small number of, of factors which are known to be involved and generalising that to actually an overall predisposition without knowledge of your lifestyle, your ancestry, and all the other genetic factors which are out of sight. Mm. And that's where the reality hits for the vast number of these kits, that they, they're not comprehensive because they can't be comprehensive. And that's why these types of offerings in general are not used in mainstream medicine these days. My word, they would be, if you stand back and think about it. People would lap them up in clinical medicine if they were reliable and had um, predictive value which could be trusted, but they don't. And I'd also like to bring a local flavour into the conversation too by saying these things are generated by knowledge from studies of people with European extraction. Mm. And for those of us in New Zealand who have uh, Polynesian or Māori ancestry, the fit is just completely unknown, that there is genetic architecture there which we're ignorant of to an extreme degree. And just the, the way that uh, your testing results didn't sort of um, resonate or have congruence with what you actually knew about yourself, I think it speaks to uh, some uniquenesses that we have here in New Zealand, which science hasn't even begun to scratch the surface of. These tests, if they're going to be useful, are going to measure something valid, are probably more valid for uh, for people with European ancestry because that's what they've been tailored for. That's a really and good point. With... Yeah, Kelda, thank you for that. Um, actually, uh, another DNA expert said to my husband, "Fuck a papa can tell you more about who you are rather than your DNA." So I thought it was really generous. Uh, I tell you, oh, well, I, look, I tell you what. You know, when I, as a clinical geneticist, sit down with families, it's very often people with European extraction that could go back um, three or four generations. But the um, far now that I meet with Māori ancestry can go way, way, way back. Mm. And that, by definition, has to be a treasure trove of understanding. So could you therefore give us a healthier hoax rating for these DNA health kits that are at home? Well, can I give you a very verbose answer to that? OK. And that is... <laughs> <laughs> and that is that these genetic tests are actually exploiting something which I think is really healthy. People wanting to understand the genetic underpinnings of their susceptibilities and adjust their life accordingly. I also think it's healthy that medicine wakes up to this technology because it's precise and it's individualised rather than just treating us all the same. Where I might edge towards the hoax end of the spectrum is to suggest that these tests, just by the fact that actually we don't know enough yet, are not comprehensive enough to be a reliable summative um, uh, estimates of people's liability. So that sounds like a roundabout a one, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, we also, we choose what we want to believe. I mean, I can look on Instagram and find something that tells me that I want it to say, and therefore I can follow those kind of tips that it's giving me about lifestyle. So like you say, at least there is a, a basis in science, if we take out of this, that our genetics can give clues when we look at a full picture with a qualified health professional that can give us insights for sure but when it comes to these uh, home test kits we can't be sure and we we can't basically bank our lives on it that's true i kind of estimated robertson's score there william ferguson is a little more definite so there are things you can hang your hat on like i think the information we get from the BRCA gene and things you can't hang your hat on like that report you got on just nine genes 
it was like, say, you are a cancer. You were born in June. It was yeah, pretty yeah, much yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so would you be willing to give us a healthier hoax uh, rating then, if we know that five is the best and zero is the worst? Well, uh, I, I would only give it like 1.5, but not to throw the baby out with the bath water on this, because, I mean, there are, there are a couple of genes there that, you know, that I think are really useful and important. So, home-based DNA tests for diet and fitness get a healthier hoax rating of 1.5 from us. They might be more useful if you pay a lot more for the medical results and if you sit down with a GP like William Ferguson to go through them. I, I think the future, this is definitely the future, there's no question. We're just a little bit early in the game for it and, and there's a lot of stuff flying around out there that you know probably isn't that helpful. Tēnā koutou katoa, thanks for listening to Healthy or Hoax, hosted by me, Stacey Morrison. A huge thank you to William Ferguson for all the time spent deciphering my DNA results, and to Professor Stephen Robertson. Both of you made an extremely complex science easy to understand. This episode was produced by Liz Garten and engineered by Alex Aylett McMillan and Jeremy Veal. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. You can find all the Healthier Hoax episodes on the RNZ website or any of the podcasting apps like Apple Podcasts, Spotify or iHeartRadio. While you're there, check out RNZ's other brilliant podcasts, New Zealand Wars, Stories of Tainui. And follow us so you don't miss the next episode where we'll look into virtual stomach banding.